flair. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to the Nikon Theater stage, Corey Rich. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Well, thanks a bunch. As Mike said, my, my passion really is being outside. I love spending time in outdoor adventure environments. You know, if you had to put a job title or career title on me, it would be adventure photographer or storyteller in outdoor adventure environments. I find I'm the happiest when I'm deep in the snow or hanging off of a cliff or going underwater to make pictures. I just really love that challenge of, of working in outdoor environments. My roots are really in rock climbing. I fell in love with the rock climbing world. And it was a natural extension to actually start borrowing my father's camera to try to make pictures of these weekend adventures. Um, and, and one of the things that happens in the climbing world is that it's, we all share the same playing fields, right? Unlike being a football player or, or golfer, you just don't bump into Tiger Woods at your local community golf course. But in the climbing world, you do. You bump into the legends of climbing. And so quickly I found not only was I making pictures of the climbing world, but I was documenting sort of the elite in that world, telling their stories in the outdoor adventure environment. What, what I also realized pretty early on was that in photographing adventure sports or whatever it is you're going to photograph, everyone is thinking in terms of the same way. You're trying to surprise your audience with the types of pictures that you're making. So you shoot the establishing photo and then you shoot the detail photo, but you want to find new and unique perspectives. And so I was striving to do that in everything that I shot in the climbing world. So here this is a photograph of, of someone clipping a rope into a carabiner, a carabiner, and I'm trying to get close. I'm trying to show the climbing world in a new way. I figured out pretty early on that in photography, the way you make interesting pictures is you, you get out there when the light is beautiful. This is at sunrise in Mexico. This is my climbing partner ascending a rope so that we could be high on the cliff at sunrise. And it's always keeping your eyes open, right? It's you're prepared to make pictures. You have a preconceived idea of what the picture is going to be. But oftentimes it's the unexpected moment that turns out to be the best image. I had a vision of photographs a thousand feet higher on the cliff, but this photograph by far was the most interesting picture I made on this jaunt to Mexico. You know, whether you're photographing rock climbing or whether you're photographing your family, you want to surprise your audience with the perspective, the position of the camera, the point of view. And, and one of the things that I pride myself on is I'm really comfortable in vertical environments. You might be looking at this picture and saying, wait, I think I own that same ladder. It's in my garage. It's called the Little Giant. And the answer is yes, this is the same ladder that you might have bought at Home Depot. And one day on a shoot, we bought this thing at Home Depot and, and I was trying to get myself away from the wall to photograph Alex Honnold. Alex Honnold has become sort of a, a household name in the climbing world. He was on the cover of National Geographic for climbing without a rope a couple of years ago. And he just recently became the first human being ever to climb El Capitan without a rope in Yosemite National Park. But by standing on this ladder, and this looks more precarious than it actually, I mean, it was scary because if I slipped off the ladder, I was going to hit the wall, but I, of course, was attached to a rope. But it allowed me to get into a, a unique position, right? That's whether you stand on a chair at Thanksgiving to shoot your family, or whether it's you're hanging on a ladder, getting yourself into those environments makes more compelling photographs, right? And that's our goal. Photography. And, and showing photos to your mom doesn't count, but when you show a picture to an audience and if people say, wow, it worked, and if they're totally unaffected, guess what, it didn't work. That's how photography works. It's, there's a collective subjective. It's subjective whether it's good, but if everybody says it's good, it's a good picture, and if everyone doesn't respond, it's not that good. So I'm always trying to get myself into an, a position that surprises the audience. This is in Mexico, I'm, I'm applying my rock climbing skills. I'm hanging over a waterfall to photograph Dane Jackson. Dane is now maybe the most accomplished whitewater kayaker alive today, but this is what it allowed me to do. I'm hanging in an otherwise impossible place. Now, oftentimes I'll show these pictures and people say, do you like to take risks to take pictures? And the answer is absolutely not. I am, I am incredibly conservative about where I put myself and kind of weighing that risk to reward ratio. Everything is calculated that I'm doing. This is, while it makes an impressive picture, frankly, I'm hanging on a rope so that I'm not trying to dangle off of the rock and risk slipping into the water. So it's, I'm never taking risks to make the pictures. 
I realized pretty early on that photographing adventure sports wasn't just about that peak action, right? It wasn't just the moment when the guy's hanging onto the cliff or going over the waterfall. It's all of the lifestyle that surrounds the action adventure sports world. You know, we as photographers or we as folks that are interested in electronics, we want to believe that we spend all of our time taking pictures. But look, we're at a trade show. We're talking about the act of taking pictures. And the same thing happens in the climbing world. And so I realized early on, I needed to photograph those moments, capture the lifestyle that surrounds these activities. So here it is, I'm, I'm sh I always have a camera around my neck or it's very close to me. And this is a camping trip, you know, gone bad climbing trip, it snowed in the Utah desert. And so I made a picture of my friend sleeping in his sleeping bag. It's, I spend a lot of time, I have spent a lot of time over my lifetime hanging on the side of cliffs, sleeping in a portal edge. This is sort of a hanging hammock and, and we'll put the fly on it or the tent if we think it's gonna rain. And people always ask, what does it feel like to sleep 2,000, 3,000 feet above the ground? And the answer is, you know, if you're tired enough, it's the best sleep you'll ever get because you're just exhausted when you crawl into this portal edge. You fall asleep immediately. But it's again, keeping that camera, making pictures of environments that everyone doesn't have access to. That's really, that's part of the storytelling aspect of documenting whatever world you live in, whatever world you have access to. This is a trip to, uh, to climb, see that spectacular rock spire in the background? That's called Cerro Torre. It's on the southern tip of South America in Patagonia. This was a trip several years ago to do the first free ascent, meaning without pulling on the equipment of Cerro Torre with David Lama and Peter Ortner. And so this is, Patagonia has the worst weather in the world, and so you're, you make these calculated decisions. You wait for two or three weeks, and then you see a blip on the radar that the clouds are gonna clear and it's gonna stop snowing, and the wind is gonna go from 100 miles an hour down to 10 miles an hour, and you sprint into the mountains to try to climb. And so I'm always making these decisions you know, I have to be an athlete, but at the same time, I'm there to be a journalist. And so I try to decide when do I pull that camera out of my bag to take pictures, because I only have so much energy to take those pictures, but I have to still keep up with the athletes. And so this is a moment where I decided this is such a spectacular moment as the sun is hitting Cerro Torre. I pulled the camera out, I burned the extra energy knowing that it's a special moment. But I like shooting everything that surrounds the sports world. These were three kids. We did a shoot for the North Face years ago. It was just a camping trip. And, and my job is to just document the camping trip. Um, but I, I just love those moments, right? The idea is I want photographs to encourage people to go outside. This is um, underwater cave exploration in the scuba diving world. I love challenge. I love getting put into situations where I haven't done it 50 times or 10 times. I'm problem solving. I'm doing it on the fly. I live in Lake Tahoe, California. It's my favorite place on the planet. And this is a pretty rare show. My neighbor, Jeff Stone, is sitting in the front row. And he can attest to the fact that uh, I'm gone a lot. I spend a lot of time traveling to exotic locations. And, but in my backyard, we have an incredible backdrop. And one of the things I've really prided myself on as I've gotten older is pitching clients on coming to Tahoe, trying to get jobs to come to us. And we have a great backdrop for doing that. We have an incredible wilderness on the west side of the lake, and we have incredible mountains on the east side and a beautiful blue lake. And usually, not this season, we get a lot of snow. But I'm always looking for ways to show that world in a different way, right? I'm saying the same thing, but now I'm talking about snow. I've shot at Vail Resorts, Heavenly Ski Resort, for 15 years now. And every year I need to make new interesting pictures. And so I'm thinking in that same way. How do I get my camera? How do I get myself into a unique position? And we did this by renting a small helicopter, a Robinson 44, and flying over the athletes as they were skiing. And it made for an interesting, interesting composition with the athlete in that spot and the play on shadows and the trees. One of the other things I always say is always talk to the people that you're photographing. This is um, kind of the, fam the dynasty of, of whitewater kayaking, the Jackson family. Eric Jackson, the, the driver with one hand out the window, is an Olympian and a multi-time world champion. And those are his kids strapped to the roof of the car. And after spending, I spent a week with the Jacksons. Uh, they were in a chapter of a coffee table book that I shot years ago. And at the end of the shoot, I said, Eric, do you guys have any other ideas for photographs? And he said, 
and he scratched his head and he thought for a minute and he said, yeah, why don't I strap the kids on the roof of the car and I'll you know, drive toward you. Sure enough, this, is, this was by far the most widely published photograph from that shoot. And it's the athlete. It's not always the photographer that has the idea. It's being opportunistic and open-minded and really listening to your subjects. And that's whether they're athletes, whether it's uh, your family, or whether it's the, the folks in the wedding that you're photographing. I did get a letter from Mini, their legal department, asking if, you know, they, they made it clear they don't condone this type of, of use of the roof rack or the vehicle. And then they proceeded to to license the photograph for an ad. So I thought it was really funny that it came full circle. Um, you know, I, there's one lesson that I want to leave everyone with, and I think this is a reminder. This, I think this applies to everything, not just photography. This is a photograph. It's, it's maybe one of my favorite photographs because of the backstory behind this image. But it's a reminder, and I remind myself of this sort of lesson in life frequently. This is a photograph taken at 20,000 feet above sea level in the Karakoram Mountains. And I don't know how many of you have slept at 20,000 feet above sea level, and in a plane doesn't count. Well, it's really uncomfortable. It turns out it's really hard to sleep at 20,000 feet. You wake up every 20 minutes or an hour, and you're, you're gasping for air. You have a headache, usually you're dehydrated. And on this particular occasion, we were in the Karakoram Mountains, and we were trying to climb a rock tower called the Trango Tower. And that's Peter Ortner and David Lama inside of the tent. And we had climbed all day. We didn't bring enough clothing because we were trying to move fast and light. We didn't have enough water. We didn't bring enough food. All of that was intentional because we were trying to keep weight off of our bodies. And we got to, we got to this ridge line, and the next day was even bigger. We were going to climb another 3,000 feet or 2,000 feet to the summit of the tower. And as we got to the, to the ridge line, we were going to dig out a snow cave. It was, there was still pretty harsh light, and we dug out the snow cave, and David and Peter put on, they took off their boots, and they slid into their sleeping bags. And I was so envious of seeing them in their sleeping bags because it looked comfortable. All I wanted to do was slide into my bag and start cooking dinner. But the problem is I'm a photographer, and I could see what was happening. I could see them in the snow cave, and the sun was starting to set, but it was another hour, 40 minutes, of standing on that ridge line with the wind blowing into my face. But I wanted that light, the ambient exposure in that snow cave to match the horizon as the sun was setting, because there was going to be this magical photo possibility. And I waited it out. I stood there on the ridge line, and I thought of everything else in the world except how uncomfortable I was. I thought about getting home to see my daughter and wife, Actually, that was before I had a daughter. I thought about seeing my wife in Tahoe. I thought about getting a Chipotle burrito when I landed back in Reno, Nevada. And the time passed, and I depressed the shutter, and I made this photograph. But it's that reminder that sometimes those situations, those moments where you're the most uncomfortable is when you create the most compelling content. When you force yourself outside of that comfort zone, that's when you do some of your greatest work. So I spent the first... 15 years of my career taking still photos, always really fascinated by the idea of pressing a record button to tell stories in motion. But never were the tools there. Then finally the Nikon D90 came out, and I read a column while flying from New York to San Francisco. It was in Time Magazine, and a technology columnist wrote about the Nikon D90, and it was obvious in reading the story he really wasn't a photographer or filmmaker, but this was the first video-enabled DSLR camera. And that was important to a guy that shot photos because I understood the form factor of the D90. I understood how to change lenses and depth of field and shutter speed. And I was so convinced by this article, I got off the plane, I ordered a Nikon D90, that I threw a battery in it, put a memory card in and pressed record. And in that very moment, my career completely took a, a 90 degree turn and my career shifted from exclusively still photography to mostly video. And I want to show you, I'm just going to give you a taste of the type of footage that I love to shoot. I try to apply all of those same rules. I'm trying to surprise my audience with the visuals by getting the camera into unique situations. So this is sort of a taste of, of the type of video that I love to shoot in my genre, which is the outdoor world.
So, thanks. Thanks a bunch. Thanks. You know, I just realized as soon as I started shooting video, one of the big epiphanies was all of the same rules apply that apply to still photography. We're trying to achieve the same thing, which is communicating with people. We're trying to move big people with the images. So really the focus of my talk today is actually about shooting home videos. And I'm the most unlikely guy that Nikon could have asked to talk about shooting home videos after you just shot, saw that video. But I need to give a little bit of backstory. I travel a lot. I travel, this year was an outrage, or 2017 was an outrageous year. Before the halfway point of the year, I had flown 150,000 miles on airplanes, and I'd been to something like 12 different countries. I mean, it was a lot of travel. That doesn't count domestic travel. And, and the phone rang, and Nikon, I knew, was launching the Nikon D850, which is by far my favorite camera, both for still photography and video, if I'm operating as a small production or a one-man band. And the request was, Corey, we want you to help us launch the Nikon D850, but we want you to do it in a way that doesn't require high production value, meaning do it alone. Use the camera the same way that you use the Nikon D90 in the very beginning. And I thought, that's kind of a fun challenge. That's actually what I fell in love with to begin with, was the idea of just holding a camera and recording still moments or, or video moments. And, and so I thought about it, and I have to admit, I was really burnt out. I was just so tired from traveling. I was jet lagged. I missed my daughter. I missed my wife. I missed our dog. I missed my friends. And, and I had, I don't know, two or three days to pitch an idea back to Nikon. And I thought, you know, I want to shoot a video where I, it's within 100 feet of my house. That was my goal. It was, or maybe, I think my original pitch was my living room. And eventually it became home. And, I'm, and I, what I did is I built a little contact sheet here. And this is really important because I think sometimes people are afraid of shooting video. Right? We all shoot still photographs and there are those moments in our life those quintessential moments that we anchor our memories to. And video is an extension of that. And, I, and I'm showing this contact sheet. I'm about to show you a film. So my final pitch was, I want to spend a couple of days at home with my wife and my family and my friends, and I'm just going to document whatever happens in my house. And I'm going to make a movie out of that using the Nikon D850. Now, we're going to come back to this slide. But these are screen grabs. I just went through the video, and every scene in the edit, I just did a screen grab of that scene. And as you look at these, we'll look at them large, but these are all just still photographs, right? These are all, in video, I'm still just holding the camera still, and I'm either allowing the subject to move through my frame, or I'm moving the camera with that subject. But I'm still, I'm thinking about the same three things. It's the light, where's the light coming from? The composition, where's my subject in that rectangle? and the moment, what's actually happening in the frame. Right, in still photography, it's when do you depress that shutter. In video, really, it's which one second or two seconds or three seconds of that action will finally make it into your final edit. So this, you know, and, I, and it, it is funny, we're talking about home video here, but this might have been the most important thing that I did in 2017. With all of the travel that I did, this is the piece that I think I'll look at for the rest of my life, and it's a time capsule of what was happening at 2259 Rimrock Trail. And it's my family, my friends. And this is, this is what photography is really about. This is where I live. It's our home. Four of us live here, my wife, Marina, my daughter, Layla, and our dog, Preta. I'm gonna warn you right now, this is a home movie. I shot it on one camera, 50 millimeter lens. It's all handheld, but that's the thing. I like it that way. It's purely about moments. I love that everyone's guard is down and they're just being themselves. Aww. Look at this one's dress. I spend most of my year traveling the world as a professional filmmaker. Yet when I'm home, I pick up the same camera to document the most important moments of my lifetime with my friends and family. This is our time capsule. I leave a camera on our kitchen counter 24-7 so I can pick it up anytime and start shooting. We have tons of friends and family passing through. Our dinners are big, they feel like parties. Every evening is filled with energy and passion. That's what I want Layla to see. I wish these moments could last forever. We lose these tender memories a week later, a month later, a year later. Not just the big barbecues, but the everyday moments. 
Layla brushing her teeth, running through the woods, playing with her friends, reading books with her grandparents. Marina and Layla cooking, making art, playing music, Preta doing what she does best, sleeping. These home movies preserve all of those special times my brain can't. Out on assignment, I usually get people to do what I need for the shot, but not at home. Layla's not afraid to turn her head or put her hand up in front of the lens. I think she thinks it's entertaining. Surprise, stop. But I think she understands what I do. It's my job and my passion. I know that most of the footage that I shoot at home will never see the light of day, that it'll mostly just stack up on hard drives. But 20 years from now, Layla will get to see some of these moments at her wedding. Grandparents, friends, our dog. Sometimes when I'm looking at the back of the camera, I tear up because I'm watching life and time unfold in front of me. I know it's a bit cliche to say, but for me, there's really no place like home. Thanks. Thanks. You know, the, the, funniest, the funniest part about this video is, of course, lots of our friends, you know, there were other kids, and our, you know, the kind of for two days, I told everyone as they walked through the door, I warned them in a text message on the phone, I'm going to be shooting everything that we do at the house, so I hope you're okay with that. So, you know, I had to warn parents of the kids that came over. And so, two weeks later, the piece was edited, and, and one night some friends were at the house, and I showed another four-year-old girl, my daughter and the other four-year-old, I showed them the video. You know, it's a two-minute video. And they watched it, and, you know, they kind of laughed and pointed, and then it finished, and she said, she looked up at me and said, that's it? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of media out there, a lot of noise. But so what I want to do in this last bit of the presentation is just dissect this for a minute. And I'm going to kind of do this quickly. These are just screenshots, right? This is, it's a 4K video camera. It shoots 120 frames per second in full HD, which is pretty incredible in a DSLR. So here it is. I'm just breaking down the scene, right? I literally, for two days, and, and that was a very honest statement. There's always a camera sitting on the stoop of our house in the kitchen. That same D850 is sitting there right now with a lens on it. And I leave it on all the time so that whatever's happening in the house, I can pick it up and take a still photo or press record. But for those two days, I walked around my house and I just looked for interesting opportunities. You know, th this wasn't storyboarded. It was just whatever happened in my house, that's what I was going to be shooting. So I walked outside. There's our mailbox. It was kind of dirty, but that's OK. Like, I shot it the way that it was. There were no setup moments here. You know, I'm, I'm constantly, one of the cool things about the D850 is there's a flip up screen. So, you know, this is, I don't know if you ever tried to lay on your stomach and shoot through the grass. It's really hard. But with the D850, I just laid it in the grass and I racked focus with the lens. And you can go back and watch this video. And, and in each of these situations, I knew I wanted to establish my home because that was going to be the title of the video. So I shot the mailbox, I shot the grass, I shot through the trees, I focused on the trees. But I'm just kind of working the situation. This is my dog, Preta. And, um, and Preta, she hate, dogs hate looking at cameras, at least mine. As Soon as I lift up the camera, she looks the other way. And I think it's because it feels like eyes looking in, and that's confrontational. Ron McGill, one of the Nikon ambassadors who shoots wildlife, said that. And so, I, you know, I would, Preta's in the living room and there's beautiful light pouring in. And so I'm trying to, I'm hand holding all of this. I'm hand holding the camera. I'm shooting wide open. I'm, uh, most of this was shot on a 50 millimeter lens. And so I'm trying to find focus, I'm recording. And I know that I'm gonna roll for 60 seconds, but maybe only use two seconds of that footage. And here's my portrait of Preta. I'm always breaking the scene down, right? I've, I've shot Preta's face, but now, now I, wanna, I wanna shoot more of that situation. So now I, I look straight down, a high angle, and I, I get her paws on the floor, right? It's a little breakdown of the scene. I know my daughter's routine. She's gonna get up, she's gonna come running down the hallway, and then she's gonna ask for fruit. And so on these two days, I also told my wife, Marina, I'm not, you know, I need to be like a, a fly on the wall. I'm gonna be less of a participant. And so here's Layla, she's getting some fruit. And then she goes out and she's pushing the table across our living room. But I had I'd just shot Preta's feet, so I thought, oh gosh, I'll get down and I'll shoot Layla's feet. Now remember, you can, you can change what you're shooting by getting closer to the subject or stepping farther away. I'm on the same lens. It's still a 50 millimeter lens. 
all right, I've captured that, now I move up and she's still eating her fruit and I'm now at a lower angle and I'm shooting Layla eating the food. These are, out, these are in sequence in the edit, but not in sequence in terms of how they played out. Oftentimes, there's two or three people in a room, but I'm focused on one person because something interesting is happening. I remember my mom was sitting behind me, Layla's grandma, and she was getting Layla to laugh. They were having fun, and, and it made for this beautiful portrait, right? This would be a great still photograph, but I'm rolling video, and it's hard because Layla's moving quickly, so I'm trying to find focus. I'm looking for that focus, knowing I might only use one or two seconds. This is, here's Preta. I've, like, I've moved around my subject. I did a 360 degree circle. I shot a portrait of Preta. I shot her paws. I moved to the reverse of Preta and I shot with the blown out window in the background. Here it is, I've established that whole scene. I just showed you up close, her getting the fruit out of the refrigerator. Now I moved back. I let Layla run past me, open the refrigerator. And what you can't hear in the video is then she yells her mom's name. My, my wife is Brazilian, so she yells, Mamoy! And then my wife runs in and helps her serve the fruit. This is from that same scene in her bedroom. Here's my mom, her grandmother, playing with her. And just moments before I shot that beautiful portrait from down low, because I'm sitting on the floor of Layla's face with the out of focus pictures in the background. So I'm really dissecting each of these scenes. I'm just looking for, for moments, I'm always shooting. I don't know who said it, but photography and filmmaking is like sketching, right? You're always, if you were using a pencil and paper, you sort of sketch and you try to build an image, and sometimes it works and great, and if it doesn't, you crumple it up and throw it away and you keep on going. So I'm sketching with the camera, I'm just looking for moments, I'm, I'm pressing record, I'm stopping record, I'm pressing record, I'm stopping. This is my mom and dad, her grandparents sitting on our couch reading a book, here taking a shower. You know, I'm, I'm looking for, she loves drawing. You know, I know the patterning, right? The more you know your subject, the better the images will be. I know that she loves to do smiley faces and she loves to rub the steam off the window. So I'm in the bathroom and, and I'm trying, it's really hard to focus through the glass because you don't know where she's going to be. She jumps out of the shower and I'm, try, and I'm, I'm trying to always decide, is it one person in the frame, two people in the frame? You know, we're in a bathroom. I'm not trying to showcase the toilet, so I'm using shallow depth of field. Most of this is at f1.4, which is, in video, I'm not using autofocus. I'm manually focusing to try to find the, focus, the plane of focus that I'm interested in. I'm always looking for close-ups, medium shots, and, and wide shots, or establishing shots. This falls into the close-up shot, right? It's a detail. Layla's gonna brush her teeth or at least my wife's gonna brush her teeth. I do a medium shot. Now she's getting her teeth brushed. Then she's getting, she got out of the shower and she has her pajamas on. So, uh, you just have to force yourself to keep on shooting, right? And, and I think what's so meaningful about this video to me is that we all have a version of this in our houses, right? There's something that happens in your house, whether you're married without children, married with children, you're dating, you have a world that you can document under your own roof and in those walls. This just happens to be my life. Friends come over for dinner, there's one of her little girlfriends, I shoot that. This is one of the most painful shots for me in this video. I wish this wasn't in here, it's not a great photograph or not a great video clip, but I needed content. I was out of clips, so this, but the light's not great, the composition's not amazing, there's no great action. Here it is, she's watching television, she has a mosquito bite on her arm. I'm just, you know, she forgets I'm there, that's the goal, you get her to forget that you're there. There it is, the Nikon D850 on my counter. And I'm seeing the clock tick down that I'm out of time. Let me leave you with this. You know, this may be an appropriate slide. The D850's on my counter. You can't make pictures, you can't record moments, you can't record video unless you actually have a camera in your hand. Force yourself and enjoy the process of using that camera to record life around you. And the life, the people that are closest to you oftentimes make the most compelling videos and photographs. Enjoy the process. Thank you guys for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, Corey Rich, Nikon ambassador and filmmaker. Stick around, Mike Mezu.